Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the High Conflict Co-Parenting Podcast with Brooke Olson and Charlie Jewett. And a special bonus today. If you call in the next two minutes, you get two of Eric, right? We've got a special guest today. I'm going to have Brooke kind of introduce Eric because you know Eric um, a lot better than I do. So, Brooke, why don't you go ahead? Today's show is on dualistic thinking. We're going to talk to Eric Schoberg. Why don't you tell us, Brooke, who Eric is? Well, Eric is a really, really good friend of mine. We've met probably... 20 years ago or so, and uh, we've done multiple trainings together. Um, we do supervision almost on a daily basis with one another. We're constantly checking in and making sure that our heads are working properly and fine-tuning our relationships with our, um, with our clients. And uh, Eric is really, um, he's a great coach. He's an awesome therapist. He uh, works with... Um, with somatic therapy. Um, he is an internal family systems coach and therapist, and um, he's got quite a lot to bring for the conversation today. Wow. I want in on that. I want in on that daily, whatever you called it. I don't even know what you said, but what did you say? What did you say you guys do every day? We do supervision with one supervision. another. Supervision, I got you. Yeah, just some professional tuning to make sure that our heads are kind of in the right place and um, if things are kind of twisting us up, as it sometimes will, we'll uh, try to straighten out the, the folds in it. That's awesome. So today, what I really want to want to bring so just in... To, is, just to jump in for a second, a fine-tuning on that is that I'm, I'm not a therapist. I'm a coach and a practitioner of various things, um, but I'm not, not technically a therapist. So. Thanks for Hello. clarifying that. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. So Eric and I do a lot of uh, conversations around this topic today, around um, dualistic thought and non-dualistic thought. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this over to Eric for a minute and let him just kind of um, talk a little bit about that. And then I can just decide who's right and wrong. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly, right? That's right. That's right. Good. Yeah, we should, we need a like a a black and white button yeah. on the screen <laughs> that you can push depending on what's real here. Exactly. There you go. Or your perception of it. Um, yeah. So duality. Um, what tends to happen in high conflict, divorce, and custody, and and often in just in relationship in general, is that people are. Um, they go into wanting this way and not that way. There's a black and white thinking. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a movement into um, duality that, that we don't recognize typically, and especially when we get triggered. So the emotional reaction is kind of the visceral body emotion response that brings us into black and white thinking. So, uh, you know, in the spiritual communities, there's the notion of non-dual thinking, which is not being, you know, the intent of that statement is to not be in duality or black and white thinking, which is, uh, I think, what we're aiming for. It's just a very unfortunate term because non-dual is in itself a very dualistic term. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so that I think that's the general opening volley of of duality and um uh, yeah there we go yeah beginning point and would you say eric you know when we're talking about that that dualistic happening in our bodies that that experience of it that what we're really trying to do in that is organize um our thought pattern into something that we could try to solve that has a um has an experience that gets that outside of us and puts it on somebody else or something else as the place to solve it? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, there's blame. And we can also, like, people can also be in self-blame, compulsively in duality about self-blame. Mm -hmm. It could be kind of the victimology place and, you know, the drama triangle of, of persecutor, victim, rescuer there's still, even in those three poles, there's this notion that there is something bad and we want something good instead. And 
and in it, I think there's a fundamental layer of it of not tolerating, not tolerating something, not tolerating a sensation, not tolerating an emotion and wanting to solve that intolerable, whatever that intolerable is in the moment. Right. And when you're talking about that, that place of solving that sensation or emotion, that emotion is really expressing itself as sensation, right? So what we're really trying to resolve is the sensation of whatever is activating us, the emotion, the experience, whatever that is. Well, I, mean, I would even kind of challenge you on that in, in that one of the notions philosophically in history is the 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 first duality in this realm was the separation of mind and body and you know in some ways the separation of emotion and body and and emotion and body are not separate they're really one thing that that we can be attuned to one or the other or both and and so the movement into less duality i think is a better phrase than than non-duality um, is to be in the expression of tolerating emotion and sensation because they come together typically like as in the somatic work that I do really the entry point is to ask someone what are you feeling in your body and that very often is becomes a, related to what they're feeling emotionally in fact sometimes people I'll ask them what they're feeling in their body and they won't have a sensation. They'll give me thoughts rather than responding with a sensation. Okay. And thanks for, yeah. yeah, thanks for clearing that because, you know, as you were talking about that, I was having this, this internal conversation about um, sensation and um, emotion. And as you said that, as I, you know, as you, as somebody may feel into their sensation, then they can identify with that emotion and put the two pieces together. Yeah, right. that that clarifies that a little bit better for me. Thanks. Yeah, so it's a it's a it's a reunification of self on some level. Yeah. And then you guys, you mentioned a term that uh, sometimes I play the novice or I play the per, the person that doesn't understand these things. Sometimes I truly don't understand them, right? But for someone listening that doesn't know what that type of therapy is, did you say somatic? Was it somatic work? Yeah, so somatic work is a is an umbrella term of um, body mind connection. Okay, that and, makes sense. And yeah, and and so there are different somatic therapies under that umbrella. Okay, so Brooke and I st studied somatic experiencing a long time ago, and um, and you know I'm a I came up as a body worker. And in the body mind connection of working with people's bodies uh, was a key piece. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So within the dualistic thinking that we're, we're talking about, you know, you mentioned that it's this, this or that me or you right or wrong, good or bad that, you know, we're, we're dealing with and, these thought patterns, these perceptions come from someplace, right? Right. Well, they, they tend to come so, so we can back it up and, and look at brain development of a child. Initially, the brain is not capable of anything but dualistic thinking. Like an infant and a small child, it's all or nothing. It's you know, like a, a, a child might want ice cream and they want it now. And if the parent says, how about we have it after dinner? The child doesn't um, comprehend that that's only an hour away. The child goes into emotional reaction because that's forever. It's now or never on some level. And what happens when we have attachment trauma, neglect, when we have shock trauma, abuse, all those kinds of things, our psyches tend to get stuck at that age and that level of duality and that level of development on into our adulthood. And so that seed becomes um, 
a really powerful directive on some level into the illusion that duality brings. Duality is not reality. So I'm, I'm not sp- supposed to be throwing tantrums when my girlfriend says no to ice cream. <laughs> I was supposed to grow out of that, Brooke. We have more work to do, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. We've got more work to do. Mm-hmm. Like when the, when, when the judge says you can't see your kids, you're not supposed to throw a tantrum, right? I, I know. I keep getting kicked out of the court because I'm on the ground crying and beating the ground and screaming. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we get, we get into that. You and I have had that conversation, right? And, yeah, and, I think and, you bring it up a lot. Area, yeah. <laughs> in this area of, you know, dualistic thinking. But, you know, it, it, for, one, for one piece, you know, we're here. We're here doing this podcast because of that experience of yours, right? I mean, yep. you were throwing a tantrum in front of the judge, but it was that that place of getting stuck in this system and having this being, this is a tremendously difficult place to be. And I, know, I actually, I had the discipline to save my tantrums for you. I didn't do it in the courts. I just call you afterwards and freak out. But the, what, what's, what you're reminding me of when you guys say non-dualistic thinking or um, a lot of my life has been about based around judgment and that there's that same right and wrong kind of a thing or should and shouldn't kind of a world. Like a lot of the stuff I'm studying now, or the way I'm talking to my uh, girlfriend or children when they're upset is like, there has to be some should or shouldn't that you're thinking of when you're saying, when you're upset like this, right? There's, there, and that sounds dualistic to me as well to say it should have happened or it shouldn't have happened or it's right or wrong. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. So, so great, great point. And, and where we get, I'm noticing the camera doesn't shift to me after you, you talk. Um, you got it. Yeah. It's on you. Field. Yeah. It's, it's on, on you. Me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so where the, where, you know, we can have some place of being in self and in discernment of like, yeah, that's, we're not allowed to, you know, stab our sister in the, in the, in the shoulder with the, with the kitchen fork. And so to be communicating something like that from a place of, of centeredness is really important. But what will happen when we're in duality is you know we can have urgency if we go into urgency of it which has appropriateness when there's some life-threatening urgent experience happening that's appropriate but where we go into duality we can be in in a level of urgency that doesn't really reflect what's happening our nervous systems get spun up and we want to fix something right now and and that intensity is um, you know, where it's in a situation that isn't urgent, that's really an important thing to be able to recognize in the moment. And it's really difficult to recognize in the moment. Like when we get triggered and are in emotional reaction to see that, um, that things are, are not so urgent that we can stay in a centered place and be in, in communication is, uh, it's going to help the relationship and the communication and help it land. Because if someone we're talking to is in urgency and we respond with urgency, then we're throwing fuel on the fire. But if we can stay in our own center while we are in that um, interchange, that's going to be a different game. Now, the trick also with that is if my partner is in emotional reaction and coming at me, I can stay centered for some duration of time. And before long, I either need to say, I need a pause because I'm starting to have parts come up that are really triggered Mm -hmm. and I don't want to do that or I get triggered and then we're in the mess and Mm -hmm. we're in the high conflict. High conflict doesn't, doesn't happen. High conflict doesn't happen when it's just one person being triggered. It really takes two Mm. which I think is the name of one of your books, bro. That's, that's one of the taglines, isn't it? That we created right. years ago. So I, I think that that's a really important piece to, to gather here. And this, I, I want to bring two pieces that you just said in Eric, one about 
the urgency piece, the recognition of is this urgent or is this not urgent, and to be able to pull those pieces apart. Because when we're in the conflict, when we've been in abusive relationships, when we've got early trauma and that stuff comes forward, those triggers hit, and we want to shift that, and we want to shift it now. And um, there comes with that a sense of urgency that I believe is, a, is an internal, I want to get out of this sensation kind of a thing because this is danger time. And then secondarily, and I want you to comment on both of these as I come back to it, is when we're in these high conflict pieces that we're talking about primarily in this arena, we're talking about not our partner most of the time, sometimes it is, but oftentimes with our ex. And when that trigger comes in from that external piece, it's not in the room, it's not in our face in that moment. If the people are doing what I'm suggesting that they're doing is doing their disengagement dance through our family wizard and those types of arenas, they've got a buffer to it. However, when that email comes through, they do get triggered and oftentimes there is that urgent to respond and what we're trying to do with this program and the, and the components that we put to it are exactly what you are saying is to step on the um, pause button to make mm -hmm. that unilateral decision to withdraw or to pull back and then to process is this a response I really need to make right mm -hmm. right right and do I need to even respond at all correct Right. And, right. and I think that, you know, then the, there's some, there's the duality of, I have to respond and, and which may be a more subtle version of the duality that shows up in the, in the urgency of needing to defend against what I think is coming at me or not. Right. And the place where I, where being, yelled at or judged or accused or um whatever is um does not necessarily need to have any response and certainly finding a way to respond in a calm and clear way is an option and the process of learning how to do that is you know, there's layers of it. There's the recognition of that and being able to watch, you know, um, uh, a talk like what we're doing right now, you can kind of get it cognitively, but then to take that into the arena of dealing with your ex is another flavor. So there, there's a piece here. You didn't probably listen to the podcast that I did last week. And I like to bridge podcasts week to week uh, uh, to as much as I can. And one of the things that I do personally, when I'm in that triggered place, in that place of trying to come out of that reaction and that dualistic re response is to um, ask myself the question of what if, which is what the whole podcast was about last week. What if I don't do anything here? What if this is just something that will pass? What if Mm -hmm. there's something here for me to learn and to come into that inquiry rather than the reaction of it as a, as a way to start to really dance with, with the duality. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. And, and, you know, that really kind of comes into the, into the arena also of picking your battles, you know, like, like this one might not be that important, you know, mm. like if you pick one out of 10, onslaughts to respond to and let the other nine kind of not be responded to that might work you know some some version of that to be able to, to settle and and to be in that tolerate the situation that's pretty awesome bro because it's most people probably just react automatically especially if it's with an ex they've had a lot of conflict with right because there's a pattern there and a desire to defend and all that but it sounds like that's at least a two-step process one is do I need to react or do I choose to react at all, right? Secondly, if I choose to react, which ways of, the, of my choices could I react, right? Do I react in a triggered state or, I mean, I was with Brooke in his office freaking out upset and he's like, let's take the dog for a walk. 
I'm like, all right, mm-hmm. let's take the dog for a walk. But looking back on it and now getting to know Brooke really well, there's a pattern interrupt, a change of environment, there's a change of physical when you're walking, right? That's the mind-body connection that we talked about earlier. It kind of changed everything, right, Brooke? Yeah, it's a whole different orientation. You know, we're, we're moving, you know, into more of a global supportive state when we get outside and, you know, the dog's there and the wind's blowing and the sun's in the sky. And, you know, we're really being supported at that moment to be on the planet. And the rest of this it has a settling so we can come into that state of um, what if. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and another layer of it is to be, um, to recognize, like one of my primary modalities now is internal family systems. And in that, there's this noticing that we are composed of many parts, that we have, you know, we might have a part that is formed to be in defense against our partner, or our ex, or whoever it is we're talking to. And that part may have formed really when we were children against some threat that was happening there. And, and so in our own work primarily, but also in the moment with, a, with someone that we're in conflict with, to recognize that this is a part and not all of us, like I have a part that really hates you right now, <laughs> is different than saying I hate you. So there's a there's a toning down of the energetic when we are in that in that place of being able to unblend from a part and speak for it rather than speaking from it. And and that takes a whole, you know, that takes like nine of the ten machine guns we're using off the table and really reduces the impact of what it is that we're saying in a way that the other person may be able to hear it more readily. So these parts that you're talking about, Eric, are developmental pieces. They're coping mechanisms. They're parts that come in that help us deal with the specific traumas or um, things that have happened to us in our lives. And I, I, I maybe, like it. Maybe that's a, yeah, that's a, that's 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 certainly one perspective of looking at parts, and 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 it has been mine in the past, and as I've gotten more and more familiar and practiced the internal family systems model, the, the way that it really appears to be going on in that is that our parts are aspects or maybe even individual beings or sub beings of us that get burdened when we're children by our, our family systems that have gone sideways. And, and where those burdened parts then are what we bring into our adulthood and into our relationships. And the healing process isn't to make those parts go away, but actually to make friends with them and do the work to unburden them, to help them not feel all of the pain, you know, like to help them let go of the pain, to send it up into the fire or the water or you know, wherever we need to send it so that the part remaining that is unburdened can have a way better party and be connected and play and, and, you know, have other, have, have the self be um, able to take care of setting the boundaries with someone that is coming at us instead of having the part, which is probably, you know, stuck at an age of, you know, four, five, six, seven years old, try and do the impossible of defending against the, an adult that's raging at us or acting out against us. Yeah. So I, I want to simplify this for a second. Great. I don't want to oversimplify it, but I want to um, just see if, see if this is somewhere in the ballpark of what we're talking about. So one of the things that I like to do, both with myself and with my clients, in this is bring this back into inquiry, which is what you're really talking about is inquiry about what's going on internally, inquiry about what is this experience and where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. And one of those inquiries, and again, and this is a gross oversimplification of what you're talking about, but one of those inquiries that I like to use is 
how old do you feel right now? Mm -hmm. What does this piece, what does this small child or whatever it is, what is it that they're experiencing and what is it that they need at the moment? And to come into some kind of a, a conversation with that as a way to, um, I don't want to say dissociate from the, the event that's going on, but to pull it apart enough to be able to look at it from that perspective through curiosity. And again, back to, well, mm -hmm. what if this is something else and it's not this? Yeah, I, I think that's that's very close to what we're talking about in the IFS model of of seeing like if we can be curious about why we're enraged or why we're triggered by some something that's happening, that's an unblending from that young part. And we are now in some version of self mm -hmm. with that part, which is adult and which has you know a tremendous degree of presence and power and love that the part doesn't have that's trying to scramble and it's trying to have some level of pseudo power in the situation which is not working out so well so that unblending is really a movement out of duality and a movement out of the reactivity that is going on that that part is stuck in mm. Would you talk a little bit, Eric, about where, you know, the family of origin comes into this? Um, you use a model um, you taught me years ago and you keep developing it, um, which is your rat tangle model. Um, maybe you can talk about that just a little bit, but how that comes in from the family of origin and how this has the, the propensity to generationally track downward with these perceptions and these, these parts keep showing up generationally. Right. Yeah. So um, when I first started looking at family systems material uh, 25 years ago or something like that, almost 30, uh, the kind of leader in the world that I was in was John Bradshaw. And he spoke of family systems in the notion of a mobile, like a sailboat mobile that has like, you know, seven family members hanging from strings and there's different connections like there's you know, the siblings may be on one stick and there's those things going on and the parents on another. And so when something happens, good or bad or helpful or not to one family member, it affects the whole mobile. And that was really helpful for me to kind of understand what was happening and what had happened in my own family and, and what continued to happen in some ways. And, and I really appreciated that, but I was, I didn't really realize it at the time, but it was, it was too pretty. It wasn't, it was like not really a reflection of, of what my own, my own family was like, nor of the families of most of the people that I work with. And I happened upon an image at one point on the internet of, um, they call it on the internet, King Rat. Um, and these are, um, a collection of like 27 rats who had their tails tangled together and had to live that way. Like these were mummified um, museum pieces of, of these that had been discovered. And there's several of them around the world, Australia and Eastern Europe and different places. And um, they'd gone in and looked at the tails and seen that that the, there had been broken bones in the tails that had started to heal and calluses at the points of contact of the tails where they had started to heal. And, you know, if your listeners and viewers look up King Rat on, on the internet and look at a, you know, look at some of the, um, the images there, you'll see some pictures of these and they're quite horrific. And it's also horrific to look at or imagine being one of those rats that are tangled up in this mess and can't leave it and had to fight for whatever they got and use whatever manipulation of, you know, domination and submission and withdrawal and, you know, all of the crazy that 
happens when you go into the duality of life or death and trying to manage this the intensity of all of this and and I really instantly saw that as a great reflection of a family system that has much more of a visceral reaction to it. Um, when I show the image to clients, I usually have to, I have it on a big poster in my office and I roll it up fairly quickly because people get sick of looking at it in about, five it's pretty gross. And, but it gives an impact of, reframing how people look at their families where they came from and helps them see the level of intensity and violence and suffering that's going on there. And, and I just, so, I just go want ahead. to wrap, wrap in here for a quick second, just kind of throw a, a, a quick um, phrase in here is all of these coping mechanisms that you're talking about within the family system, within the rat tangle, this is, this is, survival stuff this is stuff that is being reacted to in terms of existential terror right and survival right. right it's survival and and survival is really the fundamental black and white thinking like that's where it comes from is we like we have a notion like the rats in this tangle that if i don't you know do what i what i'm capable of to these other rats that are threatening me or trying to take my food or trying to hurt me, I will die. So there's this activation and sympathetic response that's going on in the nervous system that is off the charts. And in this model that we're talking about as well is happening to our children and that projection of right. protecting so let me, them. Let me, all the let me take, the, take the model to the next couple levels of where when we leave home, whenever that is, most of us have some kind of imagery or sensation that we're leaving the rat tangle because we've finally gotten the hell away from our crazy family. But the problem is by the time we leave, we've now internalized the rat tangle into how we think and, and in our duality and in our manipulation methods, whether it's withdrawal, submission, aggression, what kind of, whatever kind of crazy we're doing, we've taken it with us into our lives and then we move into relationship you know get married have kids and we recreate the rat tangle a, a, another time we're now we're now passing that lineage on with our partner and their rat tangle to our kids and if we've had parents that our high conflict personalities that are borderline narcissistic, histrionic, whatever these pieces are, we have a tendency to push that forward and to um, recreate that piece as well, both internally and externally. Right. Right. And then the other piece of it is that there is the intergenerational or legacy traumas where if you kind of lean into this and look at your parents' parents and your parents' parents' parents and, you know, whether there's, um, I, I work a, I work with a fair number of Jews, and uh, there are, you know, clear impacts of the pogroms and the Holocaust that will pass down through the nervous systems of parent to child, even you know fourth, fifth generation. You can still see evidence of this through intergenerational impacts. Right. Well. Man, this is a this is something that we could just keep going and going on, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's not a light subject. You know, Eric and I spend hours sitting around batting this one back and forth, and it never seems to quite end. <laughs> um, and it, and and the problems that, that this this thinking creates is is far and wide in terms of its repercussions so being able to just try to just to start this conversation for the people that are listening to this to start this idea of um you know stepping back and taking a look at these parts that are going on inside that these places where um we can start to go where i was going with you a little bit earlier charlie was to start to you know talk about all this stuff that you've been in in the courts and then to look at the evolution that's happened for you 
because of this that wouldn't have happened if you weren't in this, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that takes us to a form of non-dualistic thinking of expanding that out of going, this is what's happening in the moment, but what's the possibility of the bigger picture and where this might take me as an evolutionary component as well, right? Yeah, the, the whole, the phrase life is happening for me, not happening to me has been really useful in my life to open up my mind a little bit because I used to be so good and bad or shouldn't, shouldn't or upset or, you know, reacting to how things happened if they weren't what I wanted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Eric, I want to, I want to come into a little bit of the conversation that we've got because we got about another 10 minutes or so that we can play here. But um, I, I want to kind of counterpoint to the, the conversation with the non-dualistic conversation. And, um, you know, I, I touched on that for a moment. And what you said earlier is, is, you know, there's dualism in that non-dualistic conversation inherently, but this is kind of what we're aiming at. But I think, um, you know, some of the things that as we start to explore more non more non dualistic thought is that we've got a little bit greater vision. We can see more. We can you know through that inquiry, and there becomes more um, there becomes more reasoning ability, and it's easier to expand our perception. But there's some landmines here too, aren't there? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, there's lots of places where we can get you know, move from less dualistic places, you know, our movement from duality into less duality, I prefer over non-duality. Right. Right. I'm pretty sure I'm never going to find non-duality for more than a, you know, a minute. Not in this know. lifetime. Right, <laughs> that's right. But I can, I do find myself moving more and more into less duality. And, you know, I think there are places where people, um, you know, they find meditation practices, for instance, and find the healing that can come from meditation practices. And also many times people will um, use meditation as a way to repress these parts that are in a lot of pain. And if we're repressing them rather than befriending them and helping them heal and helping them not feel alone or, you know, abused, um, you know, those parts will pop back up again. And, and the place, you know, that's the term that has become pretty prevalent around that form of, of repression is spiritual bypassing. But really that conversation about spiritual bypassing uh, becomes an exploration of all the forms of bypassing that we can do. We can drink or we can smoke pot or we can, you know, work too much or we can, you know, go into our tech and bypass all kinds of things in so many ways. You can really use anything to bypass. We can use any experience that we choose to move out of being in pain and in suffering. And, and that's not necessarily a fully bad thing because we might need a bridge experience of doing some bypass, but if we forget that that's what's going on, then we're going to be in the mix of repressing and, you know, we might need to navigate all the pain of being in duality about, you know, judging people who aren't meditating, for instance. Um, And, and, you know, those, those things become, they compound and they become a, a, you know, the ball that rolls down the hill and just gets bigger and bigger and becomes something that can have a secondary destruction on our lives as we try and bypass being in the experience of tolerating the sensation of whatever it is that's cooking in us. Yeah. I remember um, a specific time when you and I were having a a conversation. I think I was kind of deep in my stuff and um, your comment to me was as well, it's only sensation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know how much you can tolerate here. Right. And it's amazing because if we allow ourselves that perspective, that step back to this idea that this is only sensation, 
however intense it is, it does have a lifetime and it is shorter than we believe it is in most cases. Mm -hmm. And if we can tolerate that from that ability to notice it, to be an observer of it, we get that opportunity to go through it and then open up to this next inquiry. What are you thinking about all this, Charlie? Well, we're swimming in the deep end of the pool. And I don't know if I brought my floaties. <laughs> Good stuff, man. It's really, I mean, I'm sitting here when you said, I'm like, oh, that's neat, man. This is only sensation. And then you said this sensation has a lifetime. And I'm like, oh, ooh, like shiny objects for me. They're really, <laughs> really, really cool new language and sort of new thought process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember Brooke talking to me about it. I believe Brooke in different language saying, you know, it hurts until it doesn't hurt anymore. Right. And when you got stung by the, whatever it was, stingray or manta ray or whatever it was. Right. Yep. And that was your version, I suppose, of it's, it's, it's only sensation to me and it has a lifetime. Right. And, and, and suppose, sometimes it, it only hurts until it doesn't hurt. And then sometimes it only doesn't hurt until it hurts again. Right. Well, that's the, that's the pattern, right? We're either in suffering or waiting for one to come. <laughs> I mean, so it's well, and there's, a, there's a thing that we can also be with around, um, you know, having a reaction or an anger or an upset or, or pain even, is that sometimes we can go inside and, and ask the part that is bringing this pain in to, to give a little space, not to go away, not to repress it, but to ask it to like, hey, can you just back up a little bit so I can be with you rather than be you? Mm. And as that part can relax and recognize that, that, that I can be there with it much more effectively and help it than if I'm blended with it, if I'm all merged with it and I'm trying to be in the fight or flight of trying to solve shit from being it, that that doesn't work but i can you can really and th and that kind of harkens into this less dual of like hey i can ask for a little space and you know the scale of one to ten i can go from being in a ten down to a five or a six or something and everything changes in that moment which is pretty remarkable mm, like to, to go inside and be able to ask a part to back up and turn the volume down and for it to do that like every time I do that, I'm kind of amazed. And every time I have a client do that, they're amazed. It can, it's really quite an effective, simple tool that is, that only requires this acceptance of we are, we're parts. We have, we have parts and we're more than the sum of our parts is one of Richard Schwartz's books. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. There's something, there's something to be found in that idea of parts for sure. As I'm sitting, listening to it as a total novice, I'm like, Whoa, wait a minute here. Like <laughs> anything you're feeling, that's not necessarily who you are. There's a part of you that whatever is triggered or feels pain from that or something. And you can ask that part questions or talk to it like, like another entity. That's, that's pretty cool. It's an amazing therapeutic model. And it mm -hmm. is, it is showing some, uh, incredible amounts of effectiveness with working with people here. It's, it's an incredible, incredible model. Mm -hmm. That's neat. I want to I circle back here for a second to the conversation about bypass for a minute before we finish up here, because, you know, in this conversation and, and the conversation that I'm constantly having with, with my clients and then the parents that I work with is trying to move more toward this non-dualistic, um, less dualistic, conversation. I'm going to reframe that from now on, Eric. I'm going to <laughs> make that shift consciously as much as I can. But there is almost this place where I find a lot of people almost instantly go to bypass where, you know, they'll go to some other model of um, spirituality or religion or um, behavioral um, beliefs that okay, now I get to soften and I have to be nicer and I got to tolerate more of the other person's stuff. And I think that that's one of the dangers, at least in this high conflict piece that we're talking about, because people will lose the sense of the boundaries that we're really trying to create. Because in, able, in, in order to be able to do this effectively, to be in this in a, in a healthier manner, 
is that we've got to be able to have boundaries. We've got to be able to set boundaries. We said that really earlier on in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I got to hit the pause button. I've got to pull back. I've got to disengage. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that in and of, of itself does not to have, to, it does not have to be a aggressive movement. It can simply be a neutral stance of no, I'm not going to engage in this. I'm not going to go here with you. And at the same time, I'm not going to have this internal argument of um, having to do something. I can just sit down and be with this and not go there and have that be the boundary rather than going to aggression, mm -hmm. which is often the place where we go to when we step out of that less dual um, piece and try to balance this. You wanna, mm -hmm. you wanna talk about that for a second, Eric? Sure, and, and I think one of the keys in it, in, in how I'm working with it these days in particular, is that if I have a part in me that is in emotional reaction, and I can unblend from that part and be with it, that's really a precursor to me being able to do that with another. Right. Until I can do it with my own parts and have compassion for my own parts, I can't be, you know, unblended from a person that's coming at me with aggression or manipulation or whatever. Right. And so for me to then be able to, to do that with myself, I actually can have compassion for people that are, that I'm, I really can see are in a lot of pain and that may be causing me harm on some level or wanting to cause me harm. I can feel compassion for them because I know that they're in a part, just like I have a part that can be really aggressive or angry or upset or want to hurt someone or want to manipulate them. And, and so that kind of pendulation between my own inner work and the way that that informs my interpersonal life whether it's with a high conflict person or whether it's with someone I deeply care for or someone that's, you know, I just had a car accident with or whatever, like someone I meet in the store. I like, I find my ability to be in compassion for people that are, that are really in a lot of pain and suffering and aggression and confusion, you know, like we can go into the political arena and, you know, and find places where we can recognize that people that we disagree with politically are in a part and have compassion for them. It doesn't mean I want to do what they're doing or support them or any of that kind of thing. I can still have boundaries with them, but it's coming from compassion and care and curiosity rather than reaction. It's got a well. far, yeah, it's got a far different texture to it, doesn't it, when we could get there. Exactly. All right. Well, Eric, I want to thank you for this. Um, I talk about this frequently as I'm going through the podcast, as I'm talking in my classes. And I really wanted to bring you in for a broader discussion to run deeper into it. Um, I also want to um, thank you for your time in this. If anybody wants to reach out to um, have a conversation with you, Eric, um, how can they get in contact with you? Um, well, the, probably the best way is to go to my website, which is ericshoberg.com, E-R-I-C-S-J-O-B-E-R-G.com. And there's contact information there. Um, you can find my email, which is eric at ericshoberg.com, or uh, my phone number, or you can get on mailing lists, all that good sort of thing. Great. You know, Eric is a great resource for me, and I would encourage anybody to reach out, have a conversation with him, do some work with him. I think this is um, an arena that all of us can use some, some more help with. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thanks for having me, Brooke, and, and, and thanks, for, thanks for your presence, Charlie, and your curiosity and your kind of view from the sidelines or view from the front lines of having been in, in yeah. this kind of level of high conflict. It's really like, I feel for you in it. And, and I'm really glad that you got 
you got some help with it. Yeah, cool. you helped all of my parts. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, cool. All right. Well, that's a good one, Brooke. Do you have anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? Nope. Let's wrap it up. And um, thanks everybody for showing up again. This is um, really getting to be something that I look forward to every week. And I hope that you guys are as well. And congratulations on your first video. Yeah, yeah right. It's the first time we videoed this. So. Video, right. video we'll version to, of this podcast. And We'll try to find a way to put this out there as well. We're not quite there yet, but we're working on it. <laughs> Very nope. good. Well, thanks everybody for listening to episode 22 with Eric Schoberg. I learned a ton, some really interesting things. And uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. And appreciate you guys. Keep getting in touch. Uh, listen after, the, after our conversation here for how to get in touch with Brooke. And then Eric, that was uh, Eric Schoberg, E-R-I-C-S-J-O-B-E-R-G.com. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.